Hey guys, how you doing? From the boat again. Yeah, it's uh, kind of windy out there, kind of blowing. Hey, we are getting down to the end of this semester. And at the, um, well, probably on a separate video, I'm going to give you instructions for what I'm looking for as your, quote, final exam. Okay? So for now, really, read McLaren chapter 16. Okay? Please do that. When I was um, a boy, yeah, I know, that's in a well into a previous century, there was a TV program, black and white, of course, color did not exist, <clears throat> called I've Got a Secret. And it was very popular. And what it was is um, four people would claim to be a certain individual, and each would tell their story very convincingly, very convincingly. And there would be a panel of celebrities who would judge and decide which one was telling the truth. So in other words, one of them was telling the truth and three of them were not. And finally, it always got to a point where the host of the show would ask, will the, will the real Howard Snodgrass please stand up? And the four contestants would kind of look at each other, and one would start to stand and sit down. And finally, one of them would stand up and claim that he was the real individual. It was a great show. It was fun because we were always guessing as to who it was. Have you ever wondered which Jesus is the real one? I'm serious about this. When you think about the various portrayals of Jesus, you got to ask, which one is it? Some of them repel me. I'll be totally honest about that. Uh, the one of the sweet, meek and mild Jesus standing in this beautiful garden, very gently knocking on this door. No. Mm -mm. To me, it'd be pounding on the, on the door. Let me in, dude. So which Jesus is the real one? We've got so many different depictions of us. There's the He-Man Jesus, yeah, strong, tattooed, got Dad tattooed on his arm, and you know, he's not going to take any guff from anybody. He's going to come in, he's going to clear the place out, and he's going to have a beer with you. Yeah, that's the real He-Man Jesus. Um, I've seen a biker Jesus, you know, ape hanger bars and the whole thing. Rawr. Okay. Uh-huh. There's the in-your-face Jesus. You gotta be saved or you're gonna die and you're gonna go to hell and burn forever. What part of this don't you get? Okay. Then there's the sweet shepherd Jesus who we see with a little lamb over his shoulders, gently ta taking care of the sheep. Whoever painted that picture did not understand sheep. They're stupid. You can't just smile at them and say, go over there, get into your pen, because they ain't going to do it. You need a dog to help you, and you got to have a rod and a staff, because you got to kind of point them into the place and poke them now and then. Oh, how about the warrior Jesus? This is kind of recent, but not really. Kill commies for Christ. Remember seeing that one. Yep. God has anointed so-and-so to destroy whatever. In the name of Christ. 
Um, stop. If you're killing in the name of Jesus, you have not read what Jesus said. And you certainly aren't living it. Our problem is that the church the church has reinterpreted Jesus away from how he's portrayed in Scripture and remolded him into what we want him to be. Now this is just much deeper than preferencing one flavor over another. It's a projection of our own fears and desires onto Christ as saving us from something. It's about our deepest fears. What happens then is we are relieved from living as he commanded. And instead we live and project a warped image of him to the rest of the world through our own viewpoint of hopes, fears, and insecurities. The result of that is that the rest of the world sees through us a Jesus that they don't want. I was watching news um, actually this morning and a woman who was protesting the election results said, God wants Donald Trump to be president. Donald Trump believes in the same things I believe in, and that is the will of God. Oh, give me a break. Does the will of God make itself known through politics? I tend to doubt it. I think God gives us the governments that we deserve. That's not always very good. What would happen, gentlemen, if, quotes, Christians began to live as Christ commanded us to live? What's that mean? <laughs> oh, dear. Really? Feeding the hungry. Not giving money to the food bank or dropping off some goods, but actually going out and feeding the hungry. Now, is old Paul's here a hypocrite on this? Yeah, partially. But I also have been known to see young men and women standing on a street corner begging for food. And I'll talk with them. And one of them will say, yeah, we're really hungry. We don't have any money. So I'll take one of them over to McDonald's or Burger King or somewhere else and tell them, order anything and everything you want. I'm buying and then they start to learn their story. I remember one time I did that and the young woman said, yeah, I just got out of jail. I'm a heroin addict. I'm trying so hard to stay straight. I haven't had anything to eat. I can't afford any heroin. I said, you know something? God loves you and I pray. And I'm going to pray for you. But first I'm going to feed you. I remember another young woman, and I was speaking at a conference in Baltimore, Maryland, a couple of years ago. And I took an early morning walk down by the waterfront. And a young woman, oh, probably, I don't know, early 20s. It was chilly out. It was misting. It was kind of trying to rain. She's dressed in a tank top. And she's skinny as all get out. And she's cold. She's have any spare change? I said, talk to me. What's going on? She says, I am so hungry. She says, I haven't eaten in three days. I said, how long have you been an addict? She looked at me kind of surprised, but I could see the tracks on her arm. She says, about a year and a half. This is killing me. I said, what is it? Heroin. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you enough money for breakfast. Get something to eat. You need that. She said, oh, my God, thank you so much. I said, and 
I'm going to pray for you. But the food's got to come first. I gave her the money. She walked off and then I followed her. I wanted to see what she did. Was she going to buy more heroin or was she going to get breakfast? She went straight to the first fast food place that was open, which was Chick-fil-A, and bought breakfast. And she scarfed it down so fast it was unbelievable. She was so hungry. She never saw me follow her. But I know that in that moment, I was Christ to her. When is the last time you were Christ to somebody? See, being a Christian is about being Christ-like. Not about what the world thinks a Christian should look like. It's about being Christ-like. Maybe we're supposed to really care for the sick even if we don't know them. Here's the one that really gets to us. Jesus said, and I quote, Give to all who ask. And don't expect repayment. Oh, we have a hard time with that one. I had to confront my nephew's wife a couple few years ago. Well, we give them Bibles. I said, that's not going to do a damn thing if they can't, if they're hungry. Feed them first. Clothe them first. Then they're going to say, why are you doing this? And you have the opportunity to say, because Jesus commands it. Any other way is going to come across as too high and mighty. So we want to, we, we want to say, well, you know, they don't really deserve it. How oh, many thousand times have we had this? Well, you know, they're just going to use it on drugs or alcohol. So I'm not going to give them anyway. Jesus didn't discern about that. They had alcohol in those days, guys. They had drunks. Jesus said, give to all who ask. Well, I'm going to be broke. Okay. Trust in the Lord. But, 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 yeah, trust in the Lord. Do I seriously mean it? I do. I do. How about praying for our enemies and rather than against them? Jesus is very clear. Pray for your enemies. Don't pray for them to be run over by a Ben Franklin transit bus. I pray that they will be healed and that they will be blessed beyond all measure. That they won't be able to even understand it. But healing is the most important part of it. Because I have to ask, why are they my, my enemies? And I have to look then at myself. What did I do to deserve this? Because there's always something. Yeah, and we want to say, oh, but I didn't do anything. Oh, bull. We did something. We're always part of the problem. By welcoming all, no matter what their background. Now, wait a minute, Pulse. Yeah. The dirty, the smelly, the obnoxious. Welcome them all in the name of Jesus. Who did Jesus reject? Only the hypocrites. And that's us when we don't do these things, gentlemen. Which comes down to rooting out and rejecting our own hypocrisies. We're all hypocrites in some way. I am guilty as charged. But I am aware of it, mostly. And I do my best to root it out. Now, 
Here's a really radical idea. What if our churches did that? <laughs> really? The church would change, wouldn't it? Because what is the church? It's us. And only us. We are the church. Remember the Greek word ekklesia. The gathering of the called ones. That's all it is. The gathering of those who have been called. And we've been called. If we began to live as Christ, things would change. Now, totally candid, guys. This is not a quest for the timid. <laughs> this is going to take courage. Why? Why? You'll be resisted. The church, well, the church, the people will fight back. They don't want to change. They're comfortable where they are. You'll be attacked. You'll be maligned. The task seems huge, even impossible. Because it is huge and impossible. But, <laughs> here's the good news. It only takes a small rudder to turn a giant ship. Now, you know I'm a boater. Obviously, I'm on the boat right now. And I've been a boater pretty much my entire life. And when I pull the boat out of the water and I look at the rudders, the rudders are quite small. But they turn the ship. Same thing on a giant ship. The, a small rudder turns the entire ship. You don't have to convince everybody. You only need to convince some. It's been illustrated that if 15% of a group are dedicated to changing things, that change will happen. 15%. Now, I agree with Brian McLaren when he says that we see 22,000 denominations as division. I've always thought of it that way. And that is the way it's supposed to be. I've never thought of it that way, well, at least not until recently. It took me a long time to come to the conclusion that this is the way it's supposed to be. And that I have misinterpreted Jesus' prayer on his final night here before he was crucified, that the entire church be unified. They would be as one. And I always thought that mean, meant we all had to be alike. We had to think alike, dream alike, act alike. Uh, no, it doesn't. That's not human nature. That's not the way we're built. It is instead, I believe... There's room for diversity. There's room for very wide diversity. As long as we keep Christ at the center of it all. We can't fall into the trap that we have somehow believed the hidden truth, capital T, that everyone else has missed. Therefore, we are right and they are all wrong. We're going to heaven. They're all going to hell. No. I believe that is a satanic idea. They too are right. The mistake we have made with so much of the gospel is that we've understood it in the Greco-Roman sense of either or when it is actually yes and. It encompasses both. We've always had the idea that I've got to choose between this and this. No. It's both. It's both. If we begin to change our perspectives, it changes our understanding. If this is the case, then the task before us is daunting, but not impossible. The denominations, then, are somewhat like flavors of ice cream. 
each appeals to those who love like that flavor. And that's okay. Or different kinds of pizza. I remember when I moved out here from Michigan, the Detroit area, I had never heard of a Hawaiian pizza and the thought of it was absolutely horrible. Pineapple on pizza? You have to be kidding me. Some people like it, including my wife. I'm not too fond of it. But it's just a different flavor. It's just a different flavor. You know, almost all of our churches are wonderful places. They have caring people and pastors who do their best. But there exists in these churches a strong, unwritten, and even unspoken rule that we are right and those people are wrong and therefore they are less than us because of it. Oh, come on, you know what I mean. The Baptists are too stiff. Pentecostals are too emotional. Calvinists are too intellectual. Methodists are too methodical. The independents are too independent. They don't have any kind of structure. Those are opinions. They are not facts. They are not theological facts anyway. They are opinions. They are our interpretations. And we have a way of getting it wrong. McLaren argues that we must re-examine our mission if we even know what it is. Is it to get people saved? Is it to teach the Bible? Is it to worship God? Yeah. But there's more. Much more. A mission is a focus. Where are we going? What are we going to do when we get there? How will we know when we're done? When I was in the army, very common to be asked, what is your mission? My mission is to take out that enemy position and protect my brothers in arms. That is my mission. Once that mission is completed, you had a new one. McLaren argues that we have to shuck off conventional paradigms of what church is and should be. Now, what's a paradigm? It's the way we interpret the world. It's the structure. It's that box that we interpret everything from. We recently had a total par paradigm shift, and we're still going through it, and we will be, I think, for a long time. COVID-19 has changed our entire paradigm of understanding how we are to react. And it's hard. We don't like the restrictions. We don't like the reality. And so we start saying, oh, yeah, I'm so sick of this. I'm taking this stupid mask off. Thanks a lot. You're putting my life in danger when you do that. And it's just not my life. It's not just not my age group. More and more, it's going into your age group and killing people. We don't understand it. Just for the fact that you think, think you're sick and tired of it is no reason to stop being careful. So how about if the mission of the church is to create Christ-like people and send them out to create more Christ-like people and in so doing bring in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven as we discussed last time. You see, these communities then see the other communities as different flavors covering a different spectrum of need rather than rivals or competitors. As McLaren says, this will require, quote, a profound openness to the Holy Spirit. We who lead must be spirit-saturated people. That's a good word, saturated. 
Yeah, it sounds good, but we're a long way off from reaching it. Every week, this week included, we read, if we're reading at all, of mega church leaders who have fallen from grace. They're caught in an affair, sexual harassment, drug use, stealing money from the church, demanding their own private jet. And it's our fault as much as theirs. We don't hold them accountable. We fail at accountability. Why? It isn't polite to point out the pastor's flaws. We have a culture of politeness in the church. Where the pastor where we greet the pastor after church and say, Oh pastor, that was the best message I've ever heard when you in your heart you think that was horrible. Why do we lie? Because it's expected, but it is a lie. We do we fail at accountability. And we expect from them more than they can give. We expect them to be high and mighty and above human. Yeah, I'm totally serious. Um, in the summer of 2019, I worked with a church in Chicago that had just, this pastor had resigned. It was huge, mega church, mega super church. The entire board re, um, resigned as well as a result. And they said, we were not holding him accountable, so it's equally our fault. Wow, what a rare occasion where they said, we are as accountable as he is. Therefore, we are not worthy to lead. That almost never happens. Usually it's, well, yeah, he failed, but we're the board, and so we're going to take over. Oh, dear. And right across town, another preacher at another very, very large church was caught after stealing several million dollars from the church. We place them on a pedestal that is inhuman and it is impossible to actually attain. We expect more than them they can give, and they know it. And so they, they have to hold this public pretense of, wow, I am totally of God and everything is great when their lives are crumbling. Ninety-some percent of all pastors report that they have no one in their church. No one that they can totally trust and be totally honest with. What a sad commentary. Because they know it'll be used against them by somebody. I had a pastor tell me several years ago that he did not dare to preach what he knew he needed to preach because he was afraid that he would be fired. Now, he's human, and we'd like to say, well, that's no excuse. Yes, it is. We all do that. Don't BS me. We all do that to a degree. What a sad commentary. He couldn't preach the gospel fully because he would be fired if he did. Now, we, we, we like to think, well, this is just the big churches. No, it isn't. It's the smaller churches, too. It is several years ago, I don't know, five years ago or so, a Lutheran denomination flew me all the way to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I drove from there for half an hour to a small little town out in the country to deal with a small Lutheran church that had internal conflict. The pastor had been fired but he took all the church records with him and one-third of the congregation. They asked me to mediate the, the dispute. And I did. And it was successful. And it certainly wasn't fun. Because they hated each other. 
There was no love. There was no Christian love, no Christ-like love. No saying, we forgive you. None. So smaller churches are just as vulnerable. You just don't hear about them because they don't make the headlines. How do we accomplish this, guys? This is where the rubber meets the road. Here's a secret. You cannot change any organization from the outside, and that includes the church. It doesn't happen. It can only be done from the inside. You have to be involved in the church. You can't just simply say, well, this is what needs to change, because they're not going to pay any attention to you. You have to step into a vacuum. Every church has a vacuum where they need people and don't have them. And volunteer to help. Unpaid. You're going to have to prove yourself as reliable and trustworthy. That means you always start with the small things. You show up on time or early and you stay late. You do all of the work that's expected and even more. And then you ask, what's next? You have to prove yourself because they're suspicious. But once you begin proving yourself, things begin to happen. Be humble. It's not about you. Take on the work that no one else wants. Huh? Yeah, for 14 years at Hill Spring Church, I ran the the food ministry, which included a commercial restaurant. And that meant every now and then I had to open up the grease trap and put my hand and arm down in there and scoop out the grease. It's an ugly job. But I did it. Why? Never ask somebody else to do a job that you won't do. Never. Always do it first. That builds respect. That also shows humility. So you always go the extra mile. Always. Jesus said, you know, if a soldier asks you to carry his shield of for a mile, carry it for two. What's the harm in that? If you want to be a change agent, your entire life has to be the change you want to see. Let me repeat that. If you want to be a change agent, your entire life must be the change that you want to see. Seek spirit saturation. The result of all this is gradually increasing responsibility. And with that comes influence. Over time, you become a change agent. You become part of the ship's rudder. Though it can be invisible to most, that's the most powerful position in the church. It's being part of that rudder. If you want to change the church, you've got to be part of the steering mechanism. You can't attack it from outside. You can't sit on the top deck and say, this is what we need to do. you got to get down in the bilge and get dirty and gain respect. It takes time, it takes work, it takes effort, and sometimes it ain't a lot of fun. Believe me, that grease trap was no fun. But when I read that, ran that restaurant, they'd find me in there cooking. They'd find me in there. I bought all the food. They would find me washing dishes, cleaning pots and pans. I never asked anybody to do something that I would not do. And as a result, I had really good crews. We did a full dinner every Wednesday and Saturday evening and a full buffet breakfast every Sunday morning. By full buffet, I mean everything from oatmeal to waffles and pancakes to bacon and eggs benedict scrambled eggs, cereal, toast, you name it. And it was very successful. Not because it was about us. We stayed in the background. 
It was about community. And bringing people together over food is one of the best ways of creating community that you could possibly do. So gentlemen, we have reached the end of where we're going to go with Mr. McLaren. Uh, later on this week, I'm going to talk about symbolism in worship. And then we're going to look at projects. End of semester projects. They won't be hard. But each of you are going to be asked to create something or research and report to the rest of us on something uh, via video and um, about what you've learned. Okay? So I know I've scrambled your brains many times over. That was my intent. But if we are going to change the church, we must be the change we seek. It really is that simple. And we must gain positions where we can be influential. That rudder, without a rudder, that ship's going to go anywhere and everywhere without any control at all. The rudder, that small little rudder, is what controls the whole thing. All right, guys. Blessings, peace, healing, nothing but good stuff to you. Bye.